Um, so thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Sarah Ahrens. I am an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about dust transport um, to the ice core record and whether uh, this dust can inform us on uh, a white, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet extent. Oops. Okay. Sorry, I'm just getting a, my laser. Okay, so um, dust in the ice core record. So um, this picture on the left-hand side is a satellite image of dust um, transported from Australia. So you can see um, the amount of dust that's being uplifted off of the continent and transported over the oceans. Um, and some of this dust actually makes its way to the polar regions where it's um, deposited on the ice sheet surface and incorporated into the ice core record. So this image on the right hand side is a picture of an ice core um, and you can actually see a dust layer um, within the ice core record and we can use variations in the flux of dust and also the geochemistry of the dust to tell us um, things about what the climate was like at the source area, so the dust source region and then also where this dust is likely coming from. So this um, figure on the bottom is um, from Bess Coffin, and I really like to use this figure to illustrate the importance of um, alternative ice core records. So this is showing the dust flux relationship on the y-axis to elevation in Antarctica. And you can see that there's a really nice relationship where um, at lower elevations, so closer to the um, peripheral portion of the east and west Antarctic ice sheets, you tend to have higher dust fluxes and then as you move towards the interior portion of the East Antarctic ice sheet, you see this di diminishing dust flux. Um, and this is kind of a reflection of the fact that you have different atmospheric transport pathways reaching the interior portion of East Antarctica versus um, the locations that are located um, closer to the peripheral portion. Keep hitting the wrong thing. Okay. So there's a really nice relationship that has been documented between climate and um, uh, dust in the ice core record. So here I'm showing um, a record from Dome C going back 800,000 years. And on the top, I'm showing the deuterium composition, which is a proxy for temperature. And then on the bottom, I'm showing the dust concentration. And you can see that these records have um, you know, they go back multiple glacial and interglacial cycles. Um, and the important thing to note here is that the dust concentration um, shows a really tight relationship to temperature. So during cold periods, we have um, heightened transport of dust to um, Antarctica. And then during warm periods, we have this lower dust transport to Antarctica. And so some of the driving questions for Antarctic um, ice core dust records were, were there major differences in the temperature and atmospheric circulation during previous warm periods? And how does dust transport and the um, variation in the sources and the source regions respond to differences in climate? And can we reconstruct regional environmental conditions from the dust record? So to um, jump right into the uh, research area, we decided to look at Taylor Glacier. So Taylor Glacier is shown here with this uh, little red circle, and it's, in, it's located in a really unique location. It's at the intersection between the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, um, the Southern Ocean, and um, the Ross Ice Shelf. And it's really close to McMurdo, so it's a very convenient place to do field work. It's, um, surrounded by a lot of exposed local terrain. So all these brown areas here are mountains that are not covered by ice. And so there's a potential to probe both regional variations in dust versus global variations in dust. And importantly, the Taylor Glacier has this ice record that goes back multiple glacial and interglacial cycles. So um, another thing that I want to point out is that the Taylor Glacier is located really close to the West Antarctic Rift System boundary, which I'm showing as this dashed black line here. Um, this is an approximate location. It's not um, exact, but it's important to note that West Antarctica is a prominent volcanic region. Um, so to the left of this Rift System boundary, you're going to have young volcanic material for the most part. And then on the right of this Rift System boundary, you're going to have older crustal material that's going to look different geochemically. 
So jumping right into the record from Taylor Glacier. So um, we drilled an ice core there in 2015 and we made a, a variety of measurements on it. And um, I'm showing them here. And so we're showing it with respect to the Dome C record. Um, so Dome C is in the interior portion of East Antarctica. And we're looking at ice from um, marine isotope stage six. So which was a glacial period and the transition into the last interglacial period. So I'm showing various um, proxies for both dust and then also um, marine biogenic activity. And then on the bottom portion, I'm showing strontium isotope compositions and neodymium isotope compositions. And these are the traditional provenance indicators of dust. So any variations in these isotope compositions would indicate a change in the dust um, source region. So one thing that you can notice is that our dust from the um, marine isotope stage six glacial period has a very distinct composition from the dust that's, um, that was found during the last interglacial period. So looking more into the um, variations in glacial versus interglacial dust compositions. So here I'm showing a different sort of plot. Um, it has age on the um, x-axis. So I'm showing two different time periods. So we have last glacial maximum 30,000 years ago into the Holocene on the top x-axis. And then on the bottom x-axis, I have um, marine isotope stage six, and then the transition into the uh, last interglacial period. And I've kind of color coded it based on um, glacial, which is blue versus interglacial, which is red. And my two records are um, shown in blue and red. And the important thing to note here is that during glacial periods, we see this um, uniform uh, dust composition, which suggests that during cold periods, we have a uniform dust source to this part of Antarctica. But during the interglacial warm periods, we see this divergence in the isotope composition for both strontium and neodymium which suggests that the dust sources during the last interglacial period were different compared to the Holocene. And on the left-hand side, I kind of have this um, schematic that shows that strontium isotope compositions that are heavier or uh, more positive have, are likely coming from older crustal material, whereas um, strontium isotope compositions that are smaller are um, young and volcanic in origin. So we were really surprised when we, um, when we found out that the dust from the last interglacial period had this volcanic signature. And some potential um, explanations into why we see this volcanic signature during the last interglacial period include um, increased exposure of volcanic material following a deglaciation. And so this image here um, I'm showing is basically what it looks like after you have a glacier retreat. So you have um, glaciers are really um, powerful uh, tools of physical weathering. And so when they're plowing over bedrock, they grind up rock to very fine um, uh, size fractions. And so when you remove this ice sheet or glacier, you have a lot of material that's available for transport. Another potential um, uh, source for the volcanic signature is heightened volcanism during glacial unloading. And so there's been a few papers that have discussed the relationship between um, what happens when you remove an ice sheet from the crust um, and you remove that and you have isostatic rebound, you could have increased volcanic activity. So that could be a potential source of the volcanic signature. However, um, looking at the dust composition and um, the non-sea salt sulfate, concentrations, we don't really see evidence of um, distinct volcanic eruptions in this record. And finally, um, we, do, we do have to invoke some sort of change in the atmospheric dynamics. So um, Eric Steig published a paper in 2015 in GRL where um, they conducted a series of um, climate simulations um, after you remove the West Antarctic ice sheet. So simulating basically a change in topography in the West Antarctic ice sheet. So what happens to surface temperatures and then also surface wind directions when you um, collapse an ice sheet. And they used four different models to um, conduct these kind of experiments. And I'm showing them here in this plot. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but um, the main thing to note is that if you remove the West Antarctic ice sheet, you do see significant variations in um, surface temperatures and also surface wind directions. And so um, it's plausible that if you have variations in ice sheet extent, you could be altering the um, atmospheric dynamics to um, a peripheral portion of the East Antarctic ice sheet. 
So to summarize, um, the Taylor Glacier record, which is located down here, um, it indicates that we have a volcanic dust signature during the last interglacial period, and it could be related to variations in West Antarctic ice sheet coverage. Um, I think that ice that's located close to the boundary between the West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet could be providing some spatially relevant paleoclimate information that um, we may not be able to pick up using ice cores, traditional ice cores drilled from the East Antarctic plateau. So um, in the future, I think targeting, um, you know, using the blue ice drill to get these large volume samples from previous warm periods um, to get these continuous high resolution records could give us um, some really interesting information about um, regional nuances in climate and surface conditions. And so with that, I like to thank everyone and take any questions. So thank you, Sarah. So um, we have uh, some minutes for questions. So feel free to, to drop them in the chat or just uh, speak up. I can hop in with one. This is Peter. Um, great talk, Sarah. I was wondering uh, how you, you see your work potentially fitting in with, uh, with new ice coring that might be happening in the near future at, at Hercules Dome, you know, which certainly aligns with, with what Eric was doing with those climate models. And also maybe um, whether or not you're thinking of exploring how transport of dust might be changed by those sort of experiments of, of elevation change that Eric did. Are you able to you know, plug that into trajectory modeling or do you have plans for that? But great talk. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Hercules Dome um, project is really interesting and uh, it's located in this area where we should be able to see variations. Um, I think regional variations that we may not be able to see in the East Antarctic um, Plateau. And um, while Eric's, Eric's work did, it was really useful in terms of um, probing kind of uh, surface wind direction variations with, you know, large scale ice sheet retreat or collapse. Um, it would be really interesting to incorporate some dust transport modeling into these kind of um, simulations as well. So that's hopefully something that we can do in the future. Cool. If I could ask one more quick question, do you need uh, like blue ice size samples to do the the um, the type of sampling you're doing? Um, so for the interglacial dust samples. Um, it's really hard, but I mean, it's hard to get um, these isotope compositions because during the interglacial periods, we have really low dust concentrations. Um, it's not impossible. So we, we did this with the Taylor Dome ice core, um, but it's a little bit, it's just, it's difficult. And so it's easier with the BID because, um, you know, even with the BID, um, we get these huge ice core samples that are um, like 60 pounds, right? And we melt and filter them. and you can't see the dust on the filters at all. So you do all of the chemistry and just hope that there's enough there to actually get an isotope composition out of it. Um, but it's not impossible. You can definitely do it with, with traditional ice core records. It's just um, more challenging. So great, uh, thank you, Sarah. So um, I think we can move on to our next speaker. Um, that's Brenda Hall, and we are going to hear about uh, the behavior of grounding nights in McMurdo Sound during Termination 1. So go ahead, Brenda. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Great. Um, it claims I have unstable internet, so we'll cross our fingers and hope for the best. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some of our work concerning the behavior of grounded ice in McMurdo Sound during Termination 1. And I want to acknowledge uh, a bunch of collaborators here, including a great number of, of students who have spent uh, quite a bit of effort um, producing these records. One of the reasons why we're interested in this particular time period, Termination 1 being the end of the Ice Age, is that this represents a massive global warming in which the Earth's temperature rose uh, rapidly and ice masses all over the world retreated um, uh, catastrophically. And so we're interested in the behavior of the Antarctic Ice Sheet during this iconic time period. I'm focusing today on the Western Ross Sea region, the McMurdo Sound area, familiar probably to nearly everyone here. 
we've got Ross Island over here to the right hand side and uh, the Dry Valley's Royal Society range over here to the west. During the last glacial maximum, grounded ice filled this region from the Ross Sea and terminated on land, producing this drift sheet shown with this red color here along the headlands of the western side of McMurdo Sound and on Brown Peninsula and some of the islands to the east here. This was produced again by that came back on land and not by um, Outlet Glacier, such as Taylor Glacier, which we just heard about, which is located right here, um, and, and not from uh, ice masses, for example, in the Royal Society Range or Cutlets Glacier located in this region to the south. These uh, boxes show surface elevations from the ice sheet and uh, indicate, again, that the highest ice was out here in the east. This is just another view of that area looking now to the southwest to the crest of the Royal Society range up at about 3000 meters. You can see the ice field in front of the Royal Society range. Here's McMurdo Sound in the foreground and this is what the drift sheet looks like uh, extending along the coastline of McMurdo Sound from sea level up to roughly 300 meters elevation in this location. And again this was produced by ice coming out of the sea and not by expansion of this ice field. On the ground, this is what it looks like. You can see these ridges. This is the limit here. You can see the moraines along the hillside. Um, these are usually a group of uh, several parallel or cross-cutting moraines and they contrast sharply in lithology with the surrounding bedrock. So this is a uh, metasedimentary and granitic bedrock and the drift sheet itself is, is highly um, basaltic. Unlike many moraines in Antarctica, these formed in standing water bodies adjacent to the ice sheet. Uh, the ice sheet advanced onto land here and because of the topography against the headlands, it dammed up ponds and, and streams against its margin. And sediments melted out of the ice sheet here and formed sediment wedges and, and deposits in these these ponds. Um, and these are the features that later became the headland moraine. Now in these ponds there were lacustrine algae, um, cyanobacterial mats that colonized the surface of these moraines as they were forming and then were periodically buried as more material melted out of the ice leaving layers of these algal mats within the moraines and they date the construction of the moraine. You can use radiocarbon dating to get the age of that moraine construction from them. So this is a diagram which gives a summary of the radiocarbon data for this area in thousands of years. There are roughly um, 300 radiocarbon dates in this area and so each of these just gives a range for a certain um, region where they've been dated. Um, and again, for the maximum position. The data over here on the western side of McMurdo Sound are our own from over the, the past years. Um, those over here on Brown Peninsula and Black Island were published recently um, by Kristen Bierman. You can see all of them are about the same between about 13 and 19,000 years before present. And so this is when ice produced its, its maximum um, position in this area. It reached it by 19,000 and held it until about 13,000. And just to point out this in blue, these are um, a little bit different. These aren't from moraines, but rather from a proglacial uh, lake deposit. So as the ice blocked valleys in the Royal Society range, it dammed up lakes in front of it. And these um, dates here come from one of those lakes indicating that the ice was here by 23,000 years ago although not at its maximum and it persisted right up until um, you know deglaciation was already underway by 11,000. Just another way of looking at these data is a probability curve and it has all of the dates plotted and you can see they fall within this time period between about 13 and, and 19,000 years ago which is not at all what we expected to find when we first began this project. Um, we anticipated that we would have dates that would be during the LGM or the global LGM, which is roughly between 19 and 26,000 years ago. But instead, all of these ages fall during termination one, 
this time period during the end of the Ice Age when glaciers just north of us in New Zealand uh, were retreating rapidly, for example. Um, some of the glaciers in New Zealand lost more than 70% of their mass during Termination 1. So it's a very different behavior here in the Antarctic. And why is that the case or in the McMurdo Sound area? Well, this is looking at uh, the Waste Divide Ice Core record and it's from zero, um, let's see it probably better on the bottom here, zero to 70,000 years ago. And the top panel here, this blue curve is temperature over West Antarctica. And this blue shaded area are the dates from McMurdo Sound area. And you can see they fall during a period of very rapidly rising temperature of termination one. This is a time period when air temperatures over West Antarctica rose more than 10 degrees C. Um, and yet the ice in McMurdo Sound was still thickening and growing at that time. Now we attribute this to the fact that the ice sheet in Antarctica is not like other glaciers in, in the world and that it doesn't have extensive surface melting ablation zones and thus is not sensitive to air temperature changes in the same way as glaciers in um, New Zealand might be, for example. But rather, as we all know, when it gets warmer in Antarctica, um, it snows more. And so the accumulation, which is this red diagram, um, went up dramatically at the same time. And so we infer then that the late maximum or the, the, the maximum in the McMurdo Sound area during termination one instead of during the LGM was due to the fact that the ice sheet could keep growing as the accumulation started ramping up during the termination. And it wasn't until marine drown draw reached the area that it caused the thinning, his, the thinning to begin in McMurdo Sound area at about 13,000 years ago. Now this is something we see elsewhere in the trans Antarctic Mountains. And in fact, probably the most extreme case was noted by Claire Todd and others in 2010 for Reedy Glacier in the trans Antarctic Mountains to the south. And this is a profile of Reedy Glacier from the East Antarctic Plateau um, to its mouth where it enters into the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And what she did was she got the timing of the maximum at different sites up along the glacier. And what you see is that the timing is not the same everywhere. And then in fact, the maximum position was reached at younger and younger times farther up glacier. And again, we attribute this to the fact that um, the timing of the maximum at any location here is the result of the competing effects of the down draw propagating up glacier and accumulation, which is still um, very high and, and, and rising throughout the termination and parts of the Holocene. And so this implies that at any given location in the Antarctic, the timing of the maximum could be different, uh, which is important to keep in mind when um, trying to model the last glacial maximum ice extent. So I'm about out of time, so I will uh, just briefly um, give a summary in that the grounded ice reached its maximum in the McMurdo Sound area during Termination 1, about 18, 19,000 years ago, and it held that position for about 6,000 years. Um, and then starting occurred after that when the effects of marine down draw um, overcame the effect of accumulation rise. And then again, this relatively late deglaciation, well, late, late maximum and by implication also late deglaciation um, was attributed to this compensating effect of accumulation. And so I think I will leave it there and thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Brenda. Uh, great talk. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Anybody? I have one actually. Um, so I'm super fascinated by the algal mats that you were describing growing in these moraines. Has anyone um, looked at the geochemistry of these in any way, whether biomarkers or, or just simple, you know, staple isotopes of the organic matter? Um, that, that's a neat question. We are, we are in the process of, um, of starting to look at the biomarkers in them, but this is just like really early experimental pilot work. So I can't, um, I, I can't give you any idea about what we might find in that yet, but um, it's definitely an untapped resource for that. <laughs> 
Awesome, thank you. Any other questions for Brenda? And remember, we can always use the chat and come back to questions later if you think of something. All right, so our next speaker is Jim Marshallak, who's going to be talking uh, about the rapid denudation of West Antarctica during the early Middle Miocene. So I think um, Brenda needs to stop screen sharing and then we can switch over to Jim. Okay, I did stop screen sharing. You Are you Sorry. still seeing it? <laughs> no, I think my, my screen might have been frozen. You're good. Okay. Cool. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Can, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Um, yeah, so my, um, Jim, um, I'm just teaching to Wi Fi, uh, Tina Van Fleet, and Martin Tina and TV, based in Bureau in London. Um, and I'll talk to you about uh, the early history of the Western Arctic ice sheet, uh, specifically in the, the, uh, the, in the early Miocene. So I've changed some time. Um, so I'm going to first uh, talk about some uh, questions I think still remain a bit uncertain about the expands uh, into the oceans, I think, of the continental shelf, uh, and when the bed first became marine based. Uh, and both of these factors will have, will have greatly uh, changed the, the ice sheet's uh, sensitivity. To, various conditions. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, uh, I try and answer these questions a little bit by um, talking about a certain provenance record from uh, IDP drilling uh, expedition 374 and Ross uh, So just a quick background, um, which you don't need about three times so much. Um, but uh, I think by the Miocene climatic transition, certainly there's, there's pretty widespread evidence for quite uh, um, uh, a lot of ice growth around Antarctica. Uh, and certainly uh, in the Ross Sea, there seems to be uh, ground events from the Western Antarctic Ice Sea, quite spots. And uh, there's again a cooler period at the end of the early Miocene where you see large global sea level fluctuations uh, and models like uh, some from the Ed Casson here. On the right, uh, can show quite expanded Western Antarctic ice sheets and, and, and you simulated in these climates. Uh, but there's no real geological evidence to, to demonstrate uh, that, that there was a Western Antarctic ice sheet around at this time. Uh, also, interesting stuff that's, that's going on in this early Miocene period. So, uh, this is some recent topographic reconstructions from uh, Guy Pack's work. Uh, and you can see that at the beginning of the Miocene, or terrestrial, uh, the mid Miocene, uh, large parts of it are not uh, terribly well constrained. Uh, so, yeah, this is the, the drill site. Um, so, it's site U1521, it's in the, the central rock sea on the, the outer continental shelf, and uh, they're in the Pinnell Basin. Uh, and very quickly, a little bit about what was covered. So, the whole is stitched into and 50 meters deep. I'm only going to be talking about the, the lower sort of 450 meters of it, uh, which span about 18 to about 67 million years ago. Uh, so this is the very end of the Miocene, uh, just getting into the, the earliest part of the climatic optimum. And most of what we recovered there was, was diamond. Uh, so to try and uh, figure out uh, where this is coming from, uh, we applied lots of proxies, uh, most of which I haven't got time to talk about. Uh, but the ones I have uh, got up here um, on the right there are the Epsilon Ibidium and uh, Spontium Isotope records. And I think what's uh, most apparent from this is uh, the, this interval from about 370 to about 570 uh, ish um, meters, uh, units 6b and 6c there, um, where I was highlighted in blue, where there are uh, very different uh, isotope values. So um, Epsilon Ibidium about minus 6, minus 7. Uh, in contrast to the, to the rest of the units. Uh, Strontium isotope is a bit less clear, um, probably because it's affected by things like uh, grain size and weathering, but still broadly shows the same pattern. Uh, 
Uh, and notably, these are all deposited in only about 400,000 year period, um, from about 17.8 to about 17.4. Uh, so it's quite common to plot these two isotope systems in a cross plot. So we've got a uh, neodymium here on the y axis and strontium uh, on the x. And if you do that, and on the right here, I've got a map of uh, uh, bedrock and um, in the, the broad colours, and then um, in the circles, uh, sediment samples from moraines and, and tills offshore. Uh, and if you compare the, the stuff from uh, these Mycene sediments at E1521, you can see that units 6B and 6C, uh, it's probably kind of hard to tell from this figure, but they, they sort of resemble uh, the values you might see uh, in West Antarctica and then the Eastern North Sea, uh, whereas these other units look more like um, sediments from the Central Trans Antarctic Mountains. Uh, unfortunately, these isotope systems don't necessarily give a, a unique answer to, to what comprises sediments, so it's also useful to employ other proxies. Uh, so the second one we're talking about is uranium lead. So you typically do nine samples and you need about 150 of the rocks and land. Uh, so there's a picture there on the left of, of what it looks like. Um, uh, and then on the right, uh, this is sort of typical spectra you might you might get out. Um, I won't talk about that too much because I think it's kind of hard to interpret those unless you're very familiar with the, the area. Uh, but here on the right, I have a multi-dimensional scaling plot of all my results for the uranium lead data. Uh, so on this, if two symbols are close together, they're, they're more similar, and if they're further apart, they're less similar. Uh, so my samples are in the, the white circles, and they correspond to the, the white stars in the, the log on the left. Uh, so, and the L and U stand for upper and lower, so, so it's four upper, four lower. 6A up and 6A lower is usually down. Uh, but I think what's quite apparent here, also, is to say, uh, the grey symbols are uh, literature data, so this is from CAM, uh, Billy Chadburn, and Willem Slice Streams, as well as um, some East Antarctic uh, Mintak Moraines. Uh, and what, what, what quite clearly stands out is that these units, uh, 6B and 6C, again, look really similar to, to sediments from West Antarctica, they have very similar uh, age populations. So uh, there's a lot of other data sets which I haven't had uh, time to talk about and all the excellent um, collaborators with whom are here, I think, um, to produce all these data. Um, but it's pretty clear that these sediments are Western Antarctic, which suggests that at this time there was some Western Antarctic uh, which had expanded across the shelf enough to deposit uh, sediments as far, as far west as this site. Uh, but you go a little bit, bit further than that. Uh, so this is a figure from uh, Lara's uh, paper, which is literally the same as my app. Um, and there's like E1521 is that, that red dot. And, and this is the same uh, horizon, uh, the same sort of package across the Rossi. So you can see that uh, this is really not a small amount of sediment, even this is 200 meters at this size. It's a really large volume of sediment. In only the sponge thousand year period. Uh, so we potentially suggest that um, this represents a really this uh, 17.8 to about 17.4 million year um, period just before the climate transition from this uh, largely terrestrial ice sheet to, to one that, that's mainly marine based. Um, yeah, I think that's just about it. Um, if anyone's got any questions. So yeah, great. Thanks, uh, James. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs>
Okay, so if there's no questions for Jim right now, um, we might as well get the next talk um, loaded up. Um, Santiago Munavar is going to be talking about bed roughness impact on stream ice flow persistence. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, this is a joint effort between the University of Virginia and Kansas University. Um, we are supported by the NSF. And I also want to thank Dr. Falsini for her help in carrying out the methodology used for this analysis. Uh, so to provide a little bit of context, one of the main objectives of this project uh, will be to understand how grounded lines respond to sublacial topography. So we want to determine the influence of bed slope orientation and relief features um, and retreat behavior. So to address this, I'll be talking about bed roughness measurements and their impact on stream and ice flow persistence. So previous work, uh, bed roughness work has been done in present day Pan Island Glacier through the use of radio echo sounding. Uh, so this allows for the quantification of roughness values underneath the ice sheet. Uh, it's been found that there's an indirect relationship between bed roughness and ice velocity. Uh, and they also found great variability um, in roughness values between beneath the tributaries of Pine Island Glacier. Um, so one of the problems with echo sounding is that the spacing between flight tracks is very wide. So while the long transect resolution can be really high, the spacing between flight tracks can be as wide as 10 or 30 kilometers. Uh, so we have also work that's been done on paleo beds where the topography can now be observed directly. Uh, so having these bathymetric sets reduces the huge gaps in data um, that you get from the radio echo sounding tracks. Um, so results from multiple studies uh, have shown that fast flowing ice can also occur over rougher beds, um, which goes to show that the relationship between roughness and ice dynamics um, is a complex one. Uh, so roughness has also been used to determine if certain landscapes have distinct roughness ranges. Um, and more importantly, we can use this to help us represent a spatially variable basal drag. Um, so I want to quickly point out that the continental shelf of Antarctica preserves a great number of subglacial landforms that we can now observe directly on the beds of now extinct ice streams. Um, so ice marginal landforms provide us with a detailed record of forming ground and line positions. Uh, they tell us that there's spatial, great spatial and temporal variability in retreat patterns. And then we have the positional platforms, such as these ground and zone wedges here, uh, which I will actually cover later on. Uh, so these type of landforms can tell us that retreat was episodic and that there were periods where the ground and line was stable for long periods of time. And all of these landforms uh, can be used to assess the nature of ice flow and ground and line retreat, the duration of ground and line stability, and the influence of subglacial topography on these processes. Uh, so most of my work has been done in the Pine Island Bay. Uh, so here we can see the paleo ice flow lines for both the Pine Island and the Thwaites glacier systems. Uh, and here is where the two merged in the past. Uh, so Pine Island is a great study, uh, a great study site for a number of reasons. The most important being that it is a site that has extensive coverage of high resolution bathymetry. Uh, it is also a very well studied bed. Uh, which means that we already know the type of landforms, assemblages, and geologic structures that we can find present in the area. Um, there's also seismic surveys that tell us the extent of sediment cover in certain areas. Uh, so all of these factors together help me decide where I wanted my study sites to be. Um, so my site one is the closest to the present day ice shelf front, uh, which is dominated by lineations and drumlin like features. And we can also observe plenty of sediment cover. Site two is where we see a transition from streamline to a more rugged topography. Uh, and site three is where we see really deep basins uh, that are overlain by sediment. And this is where the paleo bed of Pine Island and Thwaites uh, meet. Uh, site four is where we see a transition from crystalline bedrock uh, to a sedimented strata. Uh, and the, the boundary is right about here. And site five is where we see linear features interrupted by a ground and zone wedge. Uh, so the two methods that I'm using to assess the variability of roughness um, are standard deviation and fast forward transform. Uh, so uh, standard deviation is a commonly used way to measure roughness in the earth sciences. Uh, so standard deviation tells you that the variation in amplitude. So when we apply standard deviation to elevation data, 
uh, higher standard deviation values are going to indicate a higher spread between the high and the low elevations, which implies that there's a rougher bed. Uh, so when it comes to standard deviation, this is the only parameter that we're concerned with. But when it comes to the fast forward transform, uh, we're thinking about both amplitude and spatial frequency of bed forms that are present. Uh, so FFT allows you to break your data into frequency components so that we can calculate the amplitude and spatial frequency for a variety of wavelengths. Uh, so this analysis transforms uh, bed elevations into a wavelength spectra, which is a measure of the intensity of different wavelength obstacles along a transect line. Uh, so both of, this both, both of these methods are measuring the amplitude of the bed, uh, but FFT also measures the frequency of vertical undulations found in the bathymetry. Uh, so this raises an interesting question, that is, are the FFT results dominated by amplitude or frequency, or are they of uh, equal importance? Uh, so this is something that I need to explore further because we do see a difference uh, between the two methods. Uh, so using these two methods, uh, we aim to understand how bed roughness may affect the persistence of stream and ice flow. I will present my results in two sets where I compare roughness values for transects uh, that are parallel to paleo ice flow and then orthogonal to peri ice flow. Uh, so this is an overview of the five sites. We can see that the magnitude of roughness values uh, it's much lower in areas where there is unconsolidated sediment. Uh, and if we look at the orthogonal results, we see a similar trend, but we also see that roughness results are higher when measured orthogonally to paleo ice flow. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm only going to go over three of the sites. Uh, site one is dominated by glacial lineations and drumlin like bed forms. We can see great variability in standard deviation measurements, uh, but the FFT results are more concentrated in pockets of high roughness. Uh, we can also see that the high roughness values seem to coincide with breaks in streamlining. And we can also see very low roughness values um, in all of these areas that we know to be overlain by sediment. Uh, so in further analysis, we want to take into account seismic surveys to determine how the thickness of a sediment layer may affect roughness and or the promotion of persistent ice flow. Uh, in site three, we can see that the deep dendritic channels that have been carved into the bedrock have produced very steep slopes, uh, which will greatly affect the values that we see, especially in the orthogonal direction. Um, and as we move down downstream, we then hit this topographic high where we can observe a transition from high to low roughness values. Uh, so this particular high has been smoothed by glacial ice, so it is relatively smooth when compared to other topographic highs. Uh, and there's also very low roughness values uh, in these subglacial basins here, uh, where sediment has accumulated. And we can also see a change in the dominant ice flow direction at the confluence of the Paleo, Pine Island, and Thwaites systems. Uh, site one is the most obvious case where we can observe an interruption in stream, in stream and ice flow. Uh, so we can see the disappearance of lineations as roughness values increase on the top set of this ground and zone wedge that I pointed out here. Uh, so we can also see a decrease in roughness on the fourth set of the ground and zone wedge as streamlining continues immediately after the ground and zone wedge. Um, so of, of all sites, this is where the magnitude of roughness results is the smallest. Uh, so the scale at which we measure roughness is important. Uh, in this case, the highest roughness values are generated by as iceberg furrows, uh, but we could expect these sort of landforms to be overlooked in sites where there is much greater topographic variability. Uh, so some of the takeaways um, when we think about where the consistency of streamline topography seems to break. Uh, so we see breaks in streamlining that correspond with high roughness values. Uh, we also observe great variability in the magnitude of roughness values between sites and landforms. Um, and we also see that this interruption is caused by different landforms, um, including drumlin like features, uh, the sedimentary basins, and ground and zone wedges. And this is most obvious if we look back at site number one, where we have these drum drumlin like features. Uh, and if we isolate the highest roughness values, they seem to concentrate on the upstream side of these landforms. Uh, and then if we look at site three, uh, we can see if we isolate the very low values, we can see that there's a smooth bed uh, in this topographic high and in these deep basins, even though it's completely surrounded by this very rugged topography. Uh, so some of the next steps are to also assess uh, the bed roughness across different geologic beds. So we have a better understanding of different scales and different landforms. Uh, 
we also want to introduce the um, assessment survey so that we can determine the, the role that sediment plays in this. So we want to figure out how much sediment cover is associated with smoother beds. Um, and lastly, um, we would want to uh, represent a spatially variable basal drag into a numerical model. Uh, yeah, and with that, uh, thank you for all the ways organizers for putting this together and for having me here today. So I'll take any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Santiago. So uh, questions for Santiago. I mean, with a question, have you compared um, your roughness values to any of the uh, subglacial roughness uh, estimates beneath extant ice sheets? No, not yet. Uh, but that is something that I want to look at. And I also want to consider the, the difference in transect spacing between uh, the radio echo sounding and the transects that I can do in a bathymetric set. Cool. Uh, Follow-up question: Have you have you looked at any uh, uh, kind of higher level roughness uh, quantities, like the like fractal dimension or anything of the roughness? Because I can imagine you might have a change in kind of how the roughness wavelengths relate as you cross from streaming to not streaming. Um, yeah, so I haven't done that yet, but that's something that I want to look more at because um, there's a few things that will affect roughness values. Um, one of them being the scale of the moving window that you use, and that will be largely dependent on the platform that you're trying to capture. Uh, so I think that targeting specific sites um, can give me a better idea of what the parameters should be if I want to capture um, roughness at different scales. Um, so I haven't done that yet, but it's something that I, I'm going to look into. Great, thanks. I have a very simple question. Sure. Um, I know you got into it, but what is the purpose of the orthogonal or parallel? Maybe you said it, but. Uh, so, so we can expect to see much lower roughness values when we consider parallel to ice flow, uh, but then the orthogonal values are also going to contribute to the shear stress of the system. Uh, so that's not something that is often considered uh, in models. Uh, so it's something that I would ideally like to introduce at some point in the future uh, okay. to add that second component. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, do we have any more questions? for any of the speakers so far? Otherwise, I think we can go to the break now and uh, we can recombine at uh, 3.15. Yeah, so our next speaker will be at 3.15, uh, Eric Osterberg. So yes, like I said, we build in plenty of time for discussion, so don't be shy uh, and please use the chat uh, if you don't want to speak up. Um, but if there's nothing else, um, we'll reconvene at 3.15. Okay, thank you so much and thanks for coming back after our break. Um, so we have three more talks left in the um, session and then plenty of time for discussion. Uh, so right now we are going to hear from Eric Osterberg about SPICE dust core records. Take it away, Eric. All right, thanks very much. Hello to everybody. Sorry, I'm just joining you. Uh, I was teaching a little bit earlier. So what I want to talk to you about today is um, the southwesterly winds. We're going to focus in on stage three during the Dan Scott Oshkar events, a time when uh, there's a lot of activity going on with this really critical part of the climate system around Antarctica. So while this isn't uh, strictly a, a West Antarctica uh, proxy record, we're really trying to dig into understanding the southwesterly winds by focusing in on this really interesting time. And this has impacts for uh, West Antarctica and its history. So you can see uh, the list of co-authors here. I want to draw attention in particular to Katie Anderson. So she's a master's student who just graduated from my group uh, a couple months ago. And she's the one who really did all this work. And she should be giving this, but she's unable to, um, to be here for this meeting. Uh, 
So you can see the other uh, collaborators that have worked with us on this across various institutions. And this is part of the larger South Pole Ice Core project, the Spice Core project that is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, so just to get you oriented, we're going to be talking about stage three, we're talking about these Denshkart Oshkar events. And you know, the way we typically think about them is with a perspective from Greenland, okay? So I'm showing the Greenland Delta 18.0 record here. And so just remind yourself, we're at 55,000 years ago on the left, we're at 25,000 years ago on the right. And so this is our proxy for temperature and we can see these uh, warm interstadial events, the actual Dan Scott Oscar events themselves, and then the relatively cold stadial events. And we know that the ice core methane record essentially perfectly follows along with the Greenland uh, temperature record here. And then if we add the Antarctic temperature record from the Antarctic ice cores, this is a compilation of different ice cores across Antarctica, then we can start thinking about this bipolar seesaw mechanism that we see during the dansko Oshkar events. So during uh, Greenland cold stadial events, this is a time when Antarctica is warming. And during the uh, warmer interstadial events in the Northern Hemisphere, this is when Antarctica is cooling. So this is that classic uh, AMOC driven seesaw mechanism that is very well established in the literature. And then we can throw on ice core CO2 and notice that the CO2 record really looks a lot more like the Antarctic temperature record compared to the methane record, which really looks like the Greenland temperature record. All right, so we're gonna be talking about Antarctic temperature and we're gonna be talking about uh, CO2 and then we're going to also focus a lot in on dust and trying to understand how the southwesterly winds are involved in all of this. Another important thing to think about here is that some of these cold stadial events coincide with Heinrich events in the North Atlantic. And so we'll call these Heinrich stadials. And these are the particularly long duration stadial events. These are the, the biggest, deepest stadial events, right? And I'm not really interested in the Heinrich event itself. Okay, and, and like the relative timing of exactly when the Heinrich event happened. We're just using the fact that there was a Heinrich event during these to call these Heinrich stadials and differentiate them from the so-called short stadials, these other stadial events that were not associated with Heinrich events. So just to remind everybody, we're going to be really focusing here on the stadial parts of this uh, stage three rather than the interstadial. So we're focusing in on the northern hemisphere cool parts when Antarctica is warming. All right, so if we look at what's happening in Antarctica, temperature-wise, uh, during all of these Greenland stadial events, okay, both the Heinrich and the non-Heinrich, the so-called short stadial events, during all of them, Antarctica warms. And so this is really just the same thing shown in a different way. And so on the x-axis is just how long the stadial lasts in Greenland world compared to how much warming we see based on Antarctic isotopes. But what's really interesting, Anand Brook showed that CO2 does not behave the same during short stadials and during Heinrich stadials. During Heinrich stadials, CO2 increases, but during those short stadials, CO2 really doesn't. And we have additional data since this paper came out that, that supports this overall hypothesis and may actually suggest that CO2 decreases a little bit during these short stadial events, okay? So temperature is, is going up in both cases in Antarctica, but the CO2 is behaving differently. And so we're going to focus in on the southwesterly winds, this really critical aspect of the climate system around Antarctica. And when we're thinking about CO2, we have to be thinking about the westerly winds because it's such an important driver of how atmospheric CO2 is changing on these timescales. So both through physical pump mechanisms, so basically upwelling of really carbon-rich deep water, and through potential biological pump mechanisms through uh, enhanced dust flux, you know, iron rich dust into the high nitrate low chlorophyll region. So we're gonna try and understand what's going on with southwesterly winds and its effect on CO2. There, is, uh, there was a nice modeling paper that came out last year. This is a compilation, uh, a, a compilation paper that looked at models and how they change atmospheric CO2 based on how the southwesterly winds change. And what's interesting is that you have a different response based on how the winds change in strength on the left versus how the winds change in latitude. So in general, stronger winds will tend to give you a large CO2 increase versus a change in the position of the winds rather than the strength tends to give you a much more muted response. And in fact, it tends to be in the opposite direction. So normally if the winds get stronger, 
they're shifting further south and, and becoming tighter around Antarctica. And so by getting stronger, that should increase atmospheric CO2, but by going further south, that should partially uh, offset a little bit of that by actually uh, having a decreasing effect. And so just based on these model results and what I was just telling you about CO2 from the Yon and Brook paper, we could predict or we would suggest that Heinrich Stadials saw a pretty significant strengthening of the wind of over 10% and a significant shift in the winds, maybe on the order of less than five degrees, which is consistent with other literature. Versus the short stadials, well, we don't have Heinrich events, um, we think that the southwesterly wind intensity and position would have been uh, less dramatically changed, okay? So a more muted response. And so the question is, what can the uh, ice core dust record do to help shed light on this? Can we, can we find a story that is consistent with this hypothesis that we see through CO2 and through the models? And so for this, we're gonna use the new South Pole ice core, 1,751 meters, uh, drilled a few years ago. We just got the timescale paper out last year. Don Winsky was the lead on that out of my research group here. And then I just saw an email yesterday that the gas chronology uh, the, the gas timescale paper should be coming out uh, any, any minute now, any day now. So we did the uh, analyses, the melting of the ice core continuously, and the, um, the chemistry analyses and the dust particle analyses here in my lab. And so this is a standard melter system that is uh, similar, but certainly not identical to others that are around the country, like Joe McConnell's system and others in Europe, where we melt the ice really cleanly and on, a, on a heated melter head and we're trying to separate the outside of the core, which is contaminated from the pristine part of the ice at the center. And that's the part that we do the chemical and the dust analyses on. And I'm gonna be focusing on the dust record, which we get from this laser dust particle system. And this is also uh, a system that is used by European groups and by some other US groups. Okay, so first I'm just gonna show you what the SPICE dust record looks like compared to some of the other major ice core dust records that are out there. And essentially it looks pretty identical, right? So here's a, the, our spice dust record in the top here for the last 55,000 years on the left, all the way through the Holocene up to the present on the right. And you can compare that to uh, the Dome C dust record and you can compare that to the waste divide uh, calcium record, which is a proxy for dust. And so you see a lot of coherence here between the records. And so what we're gonna do here is actually like dig in and dive into some of the details of what's happening during these wiggles during stage three. And the first thing to know is that in general, all of these records show that dust flux is inversely related to temperature, okay? So that in general, when it is warmer, we have more dust raining out on the way to Antarctica from the source regions, primarily in South America and Patagonia. And so that means less dust flux making it to Antarctica during warm times. And during cold times, there's less dust rain out and therefore more dust actually making it to Antarctica where it gets recorded in the ice cores. And so this is seen in all the ice core records, but I wanna put a shout out to, to Brad Markle and the paper that he put out a couple years ago in um, Nature Geosciences that really helped me in my thinking of this. And a lot of the thinking in the ice core community on dust in the past was really about uh, thinking about changes in emission strength as a key part of the story. And one of the cool things that Brad showed is that um, you can really explain this relationship fundamentally just based on this rain out, just based on uh, how much of the water is lost between the source area and the sink in Antarctica, that you don't actually have to invoke big changes in, um, in emissions from the dust source area. So let's dig into this with a little more detail. For example, let's parse it between the short stadials and the Heinrich stadials. And what we see is, okay, in orange is the isotope record, so showing the warming. So uh, earlier times on the left, more recent times on the right. So this is a warming during the stadial, uh, as we'd expect during Heinrich events, and also a warming during the short stadial, a little more muted, but still warming. We can see the increase in CO2 during Heinrichs, but actually no increase and perhaps a decrease in CO2 during the short stadials. And we see a pretty dramatic decrease in dust, and note that this is a logarithmic scale over here. So a dramatic decrease in dust during Heinrich stadials, but really not much of a decrease in dust during the short stadials, despite the fact that we still see this temperature warming. Okay, so that, that overall relationship between temperature and dust seems to be breaking down here during the short stadials. And so we can put some numbers on this just to show 
that uh, things really are different, that the dust is not changing very quickly during short stadials like it does during Heinrich stadials, and frankly, like it does during the whole rest of the record. So we can plot this a slightly different way, just in uh, scatter plot space and compare the slope of the dust on the y-axis and the, and the 18 on the x-axis for Heinrich stadials and for short stadials. So the gray dots in the background is basically the whole record, and then the Heinrich stadials are the green, and the short stadials are the red. So this is showing the same thing as the last slide, it's just showing it in a different way, that we have a shallower slope in the isotope uh, dust space here during short stadials, that it looks different than it does during Heinrich stadials and during the overall record. And so you might ask, you know, well, maybe this is just something weird in spice, but we can see this um, not just in the spice dust, we see this in the spice calcium, and we also see the same relationship in the waste calcium, where this dust delta HNO relationship kind of breaks down and is much a shallower relationship during the short stadials than it is during the Heinrich stadials. All right, so who cares? What does this mean? Well, uh, there's a lot of hypotheses that one could come up with to explain this, and this is uh, still a work in progress, so I'd say these are hypotheses we're still evaluating, but let me just walk through a couple of them. So one is, you know, if we see less dust decline, so more dust than expected during short stadials, then you might invoke more dust emissions from South America during these short stadials. The problem is that the southwesterly wind shifts that we expect during these and that other proxy records suggest and the models suggest would actually tend to increase humidity in the dust source areas and probably lead to lower dust emissions uh, at the dust source areas. So that seems uh, less likely of a hypothesis. One could invoke stronger southwesterly winds during the short stadials compared to the Heinrich stadials, meaning that more dust than you expect is actually able to make it to Antarctica because it gets there faster. It doesn't have as much time to rain out. But if anything, we would expect more changes in the velocity so that the, the westerlies would be stronger during the Heinrich stadials than the short stadials. So we actually might expect to see the opposite effect. You might expect to see a lower slope during the Heinrich stadials and a steeper slope during the short stadials. So that's kind of opposite to what we, we see. And then the last hypothesis that we favor here is that there's a smaller temperature gradient during the short stadials. And when I say temperature gradient, I mean from warmer regions, uh, subtropical, tropical, down to Antarctica. And so what that would do is it would tend to reduce rain out in between the dust source area and Antarctica. And we can test this hypothesis because that should affect dust more strongly than it affects sodium because the dust is coming from all the way in South America, but the sodium is coming from sea ice just really close to Antarctica, just offshore. And so this difference in temperature gradient should affect the dust a lot more than it affects the sea ice. So let's check out the sodium. And what we find does support this hypothesis that we don't really see a difference in the sodium delta 18 slope during Heinrich events and short stadials. We just see it in the dust. So again, this is a work in progress, but what we're currently thinking we, we see here is, you know, Ann and Brooks were some of the first to really talk about these short stadials being different than the Heinrich stadials. And keep in mind that in Greenland, they look identical. The Heinrich and the short stadials look identical. But um, they were the first ones to really talk about it in the literature. And we are certainly seeing that same story, that there's a different, different climate conditions during the Heinrich and the short stadials. And during Heinrich stadials, we think that the southwesterly winds significantly intensified and that contributed to the atmospheric CO2 increase. Now that warming would drive an increased rain out and a strong decline in Antarctic dust like we see. Whereas during the short stadials, we think the southwesterly winds were more muted and so that we don't really see a, a physical or biological pump induced change in CO2, but we still have the seesaw warming of Antarctica. And without that CO2 rise, that ends up decreasing the temperature gradient. And so that means less rain out during the short stadials as we see in the Antarctic dust. So I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. All right, thank you so much, Eric. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're just gonna pause questions for Eric um, while we transition to our next speaker. And if you are worried you're gonna forget him, use the chat, um, which I see we have some good conversation that we can return to at the end of the chat. So.
Um, if Eric stops screen sharing, then we can welcome Delaney Robinson to the stage. Hi, everyone. Here we go. Hello. Talk to us about the sedimentary signature of uh, past West Antarctic ice sheet and ocean dynamics from cores drilled in the Amundsen Sea from IODP Expedition 379. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Delaney and today I'll be talking about the sedimentary signature of past West Antarctic ice sheet dynamics from cores that we drilled on an IODP expedition in the Amundsen Sea. So why do we care about this record and where it does it fit in um, is related to being able to accurately predict the future behavior of an Antarctic ice sheet and global sea level changes um, during our warming climate conditions. This requires a combination of both modern observations and simulations of the past fit to geologic data. This is particularly important for the West Antarctic ice sheet, which shows modern observations of warming ocean temperatures and negative changes in ice sheet mass. The largest ice mass loss occurs in the Amundsen Sea region where warm water currents flow onto the continental shelf and melt the marine based ice sheet, which is a process predicted to initiate a full collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet in the future. Similar in warmer climate conditions than today, we know have occurred in the past. So we can use the geologic record to understand how the West Antarctic ice sheet responded and the role of the Amundsen Sea. To the right is a Pliocene age ice sheet model fit to drill core data. Um, this is from when climate was warmer than today and we can see that the West Antarctic ice sheet um, fully collapsed. We do see, however, that there is a gap in data from the Amundsen Sea, and thus the motivation to collect drill core records and reconstruct past West Antarctic ice sheet dynamics to improve modeling uncertainties. So the Amundsen Sea embayment contains about four kilometers of sediment that's separated into depositional sequences related to the development from a pre-glacial Cretaceous Sinrift Basin to glacially dominated strata in the Quaternary. It wasn't until the mid-Miocene though when major ice sheet advances onto the middle and outer shelf occurred, uh, bringing sediment out towards the slope and rise, leaving relatively undisturbed stacked sediment records of glacial simplicity. IODP Expedition 379 successfully recovered drill cores from sediment drift deposits on the continental rise, and the cores contain continuous records of glacial cyclicity back to uh, the late Miocene at both sites. Deposits across the continental rise are associated with depositional processes related to glacial extent on the continental shelf. For example, deep sea sediment uh, drift deposits receive increased sediment supply to the slope and rise delivered by a ground grounded ice sheet from downslope transport processes during glacial periods. While during interglacial periods, the rise site is relatively sediment starved, but receives ice rafted debris from the melting of icebergs and hemipelagic sedimentation that's often bioturbated. These depositional processes are reflected in the sediment bases, characterized by laminated deposits from the glacial periods and massive muds with class associated with interglacial periods. A down course summary of the two sites shows the dominant lithologies that are composed of silty clay with intervals containing biogenic material. Sedimentary structures were identified mainly from the lower and more consolidated sections of both sites. And note that deposits, uh, Pliocene in age or older, 
are characterized by significantly higher sedimentation rates and were the target for sediment sampling of material that was deposited during periods when the climate was warmer than today. Samples were taken systematically across upper transitions, which contain a sharp boundary between the two major lithologies. We use high resolution sedimentological analysis to define characteristics that vary within these two broad sediment facies, helping provide constraints on depositional processes that are associated with glacial cycles. To further characterize sediment bases, we integrated multiple proxies that included analysis of sediment grain size and shape, microstructure thin section analysis, as well as CT and XRF scans of core sections. Here's an example uh, core section showing a distinct with logic boundary in core photo and X-ray. And we can see that the massive interval containing class is characterized by relatively larger grain size and pore sorting with XRF ratios that show higher biogenic silica content um, in this interval, as well as a lower uh, terrigenous component. And after integrating our proxy results uh, with the core photo and X-ray, we can see that the sharp with logic boundary correlates with sharp changes in the other proxies as well. This core section example also is also characterized by a visually sharp with logic boundary. Um, however, we can see from the CT scan that this boundary is more gradational. A gradational change across the transition boundary is observed in the other proxies as well suggesting a more gradual response to changes in climate or overlapping depositional processes. We interpret these repeated facies to represent cyclical alternations of sedimentation during interglacial and glacial periods. The cycles reflect local erosion and sediment delivery by a marine terminating ice sheet on the shelf. And this also provides evidence that higher resolution oscillations of the West Antarctic ice sheet occurred within the broader scale global climate conditions across the Miocene and Pliocene time. Uh, IRD ice rafted debris records identified within these uh, facies cycles provides direct evidence for ice rafting and nearby glacial advances onto the Amundsen Sea shelf as early as the late Miocene. IRD was also identified in the form of soft sediment class, which are similar to those previously described from other areas along the Antarctic margin that are suggested to form beneath fast flowing ice streams. The class were sampled for thin section analysis and further characterized at the micro scale as cohesive aggregates of material with variable grain sizes and they contain a composition that's distinct from the surrounding matrix material. If these clasts formed subglacially on the continental shelf, their sediment characteristics or preserved structures might have captured a signal of past ice bed conditions. So in summary, Alternations of two major facies observed now core suggest that cyclic interglacial glacial related deposition occurred throughout the Miocene to Pliocene times. Soft sediment class ice rafted debris is suggested to form beneath ice streams and could provide a proxy for past ice bed conditions on the continental shelf. Finally, uh, further work will be done to characterize different sedimentation patterns in relation to fluctuations um, in depositional processes, ultimately to better uh, de define dynamics of the West Antarctic ice sheet in the Miocene and Pliocene. So that, thank you, and I'll take any questions that you may have.
Um, thank you, Delaine. So we have time for some questions for Delaine. Okay, um, if no questions for Delaney yet, why don't we go ahead and get to our final talk of the session. Uh, Rachel Clark, if you would like to go ahead and start your screen share, there you go. You're going to talk to us about the marine sedimentary records of Holocene changes of Waits, Glaciers, Margin, Amundsen Sea, West Antarctica. Thank you and take it away, Rachel. Hello. Um we finally made it to the last science talk, so good job, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel. I work at the University of Houston, and today I'll be talking about marine sediments around Waits Glacier. Um, and this is all work that is part of the Waits Offshore Research Project within the ITGC. All right, it's getting situated. There we go. So as we've heard from other presentations today, the marine record can be used to understand past flow dynamics. So for example, the image on the right here shows recently collected bathymetry around Thwaites. And from this work, we now have evidence of how Thwaites used to flow in the past when the grounded ice was extended farther north on the continental shelf. So seafloor sediments from this area also record glacial history and provide information about when and why uh, retreat occurred in the past. So the general idea behind my work is to connect the sediment record to these different depositional environments, and which means that different sediments are likely to accumulate depending on the presence of an ice shelf and proximity to the grounding zone. So as Thwaites Glacier retreats inland, so do all of these environments. And uh, you can end up with something like this here, where you have sub-ice shelf sediments draped on top of sediments that formed at the grounding zone. So the cores that I work with were collected over two field seasons um, that I participated in. And once we got the cores onto the ship, our team described them, and then we collected samples down core for additional geochemical and sedimentological work. Um, we also sent archives of these cores to the repository at Oregon State University for further scanning. And some of those uh, sediment samples we had already collected were sent to my university for uh, grain size and shape measurements. I also used two different uh, geochronological techniques to establish when and how quickly these sediments were accumulated. And between these two techniques, they cover a time span of the past century and the entire Holocene. So for today, I'm just going to limit my talk to three core sites close to the modern ice shelf edge. And the sub-bottom profile on the right here shows that these three sites are uh, quite close together laterally, but they cover a range of water depths. And I like these sites because I use them to investigate past ice shelf unpinning from this C4 high. So to get started, I want to look at casting core 15 and MC16's core site, where you can see some faint layering in the subsurface on that profile. So from that site, uh, we collected a three meter long core, and most of this core consists of laminated mud, um, which I have an example of what that looks like from a digital scan of that core. And then above that, there's a small package of sandy laminated mud 
um, with a few sand lenses. But uh, if you look at the shear strength, overall this core is very soft and uh, it also happens to contain very few microfossils. So comparing this with the deeper core site, um, both KC15 and KC19 have similar lithology and their magnetic susceptibility data can be uh, correlated. And so I interpret these soft laminated sediments with very few microfossils to have accumulated underneath an ice shelf. Uh, our team also collected a few radiocarbon ages from the base of these cores, and uh, they provide early Holocene ages. And this implies a minimum age of grounding line retreat that would have need to, uh, needed to happen prior to these sub-ice shelf sediments being deposited. Uh, the, these radiocarbon ages also imply a very slow mean accumulation rate of sediment of uh, only 0.3 millimeters per year. But uh, in contrast, if you look at the lead 210 data, uh, which is only collected from the top 10 centimeters or so, uh, this provides a much higher accumulation rate of 1.4 millimeters per year. And um, this comparison I make is very preliminary, but it might indicate a recent change in accumulation rate that could be tied to increased meltwater deposition coming from the grounding zone. Um, but of course, uh, we need more radiocarbon ages than these three points and more geochemical data to really clarify this point. So lastly, I wanna move to the shallowest core site here that was collected on top of this flat summit. And the sediments here are still very soft but they look entirely different from the cores that I just showed. So at the base of the core, there's this uh, gravelly sandy mud, and then the gravel content decreases, and that package is overlain with uh, massive sandy mud. And then on the very top, there's a small uh, package of laminated mud. So I think that this core is recording ice shelf unpinning, and I interpret this lower package to represent when that ice shelf is dragging across that high and possibly reworking older subglacial deposits. And then the massive sandy mud unit represents that the ice shelf might no longer be pinned at this location, but might be pinned nearby. And lastly, the laminated uh, mud unit on top uh, is deposited once unpinning is complete in this area. And now we have open marine conditions at some point in time. So my work on this core is still ongoing and I'm uh, collecting lead to 10 data very soon from this site to better understand the timing of this unpinning here uh, in these youngest sediments. But uh, I'll end by saying that What's pretty exciting so far in this work is that uh, these are the first, uh, this is the first record from sediment cores that basically documents the Thwaites ice shelf unpinning. And uh, this work also suggests that grounding line, uh, the grounding line had retreated south of these core sites during or before the early Holocene, which seems consistent with other terrestrial records and marine paleo records in the region. And uh, I'll end here and take any questions people might have about that. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, does anybody have any questions for Rachel um, before um, we dive into questions for other folks? Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, ex excellent talk, Rachel. Um, I don't know if you saw Scott Braddock's talk. Um, I guess it must have been last week, but he's been doing relative sea level work, as you, I mean, you probably know, mm -hmm. um, out in the outer part of Pine Island Bay, and we're getting results that are, are definitely in, in keeping with what you're finding. Um, uh, he's getting probably deglaciation there by 10,000 
um, with evidence of an ice shelf after. Um, do you do you have any idea from your data? So you, you've got development of an ice shelf before nine thousand or so, um, mm -hmm. if I remember your date correctly. Um, do you have any idea how that how long that ice shelf persisted at your sites? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think um, this is very preliminary. Right now, I would say it seems like it persisted since that date, but we need more analyses to uh, understand the ice shelf since those early ages around 9,000. Does that answer your right. question? Right. Okay. So you think it was there continuously? Um... Uh, right now, yeah, but we have to. Um, get more geochemical data and radiocarbon ages and uh, just more proxies to better understand what's happening here. Okay. So. Yeah, some of Scott's data suggests that perhaps um, the ice shelf extended out to his sites, you know, Lindsay Islands area mm -hmm. um, until about 5,000 years ago and then it, it retreated from that area. Um, so I was just curious if you had seen anything like that in your record. Uh, I I don't have uh, anything in that time range in my record, and you know, the Lindsay Islands are pretty far to far they're, east. They're a long there. way away. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yep. But uh, that's actually that's really interesting to know. I I wish uh, I think I was teaching while he gave his talk, but I'll have to watch it later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so if there um, aren't any other questions for Rachel right now, um, I see uh, there was a question in the chat from um, Matt to Eric. Matt, do you want to ask your question? Sure. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to take Eric's paleo study into the modern realm, and I was just wondering, given all we all he learned about, you know, how CO2 and and winds are changing and we can see that in the dust record what does that mean for kind of our current state of changing winds and changing co2 yeah well i mean we know that the westerly winds have uh, been intensifying for the last you know 40 50 years or something mostly because of um ozone loss the ozone hole and so all other things being equal what that suggests is that that should increase ventilation of co2 from the oceans to the atmosphere i mean of course we're doing a pretty good job of that ourselves. But um, what it suggests, I guess, is that the ocean at the moment is not going to be helpful in, um, you know, at least the Southern Ocean in its relationship with the Southerly Winds is not, is not gonna be helpful for, you know, extra removal of CO2, of, of anthropogenic CO2 at the moment. Is there gonna be a signal of that I guess this is a question for the various marine geologists here. Like, could we confirm that this is occurring in the ocean sedimentary record somehow? Sorry, I know this question of ice cores and sediment cores being combined is a scary one. Can you, can you say it again? I felt like my computer cut out part way. So Eric's suggesting that, you know, over the last 50 or so years, um, we should be ventilating more CO2 uh, because of the, the ozone, hone, o ozone hole changing the, the winds. Um, I was wondering if there's any signal of that in the ocean record at all. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware. Maybe someone else here would know a proxy for that. I think that's a fair answer, answer, Rachel. I mean, when we're lucky, we can identify the last 50 years, period. Not just what happened in it, but, you know, that we've got the last 50 years in the ocean sediments. And I think to identify windiness um, would be really difficult. 
but a great goal. Do I need to add my perspective, Matt? Or, or can you guess what I'm going to say? Go for it, Peter. <laughs> I mean, if you're after records of windiness, uh, you know, that pertain to, to the offshore of the Amundsen Sea and, and Thwaites and all these things, we have a number of ice rises that are right there on the water that, that would provide fantastic records of a number of, of aspects of atmospheric dynamics, including potentially uh, wind, wind strength. And, and we need that to confirm this, you know, beyond what we know about the wind trends over the last 40 years from observations. We don't know anything before that, um, besides a few model experiments that, um, that do suggest a trend across the 20th century, but trends and model experiments should be viewed very skeptically until we can rigorously test them. So that's, that's certainly something that, that we can learn a bit more about if we get, get more direct records from the coast. So Peter, you're saying we should drill coastal domes. I know it's, it's sort of a monumental idea that you've never heard before, particularly not from me, but yes. You kind of beat me to it, Peter. This is Chris Schumann. Uh, I know that the East Thwaites shelf has a, you know, a uh, kind of a pinning point that is kind of helping to keep the, that shelf intact. So nobody has proposed going out and trying to drill from the ice down to the sediments is I think what you're saying. There must be other places that this would be a profitable endeavor for Rachel and company to get get their sediments without requiring a ship oh, i don't know about about getting the sediments but i mean i was talking about the record we get directly from from the ice and the recent layers of, of snow see. well in that case let me pivot to uh, rachel uh, it's fun to be on the uh nathaniel b palmer and uh but if you could get to these rises um from the ice that's above them, what would those sediments potentially tell you if you could retrieve them from below the ice? Well, uh, it's funny. So you mean underneath the ice shelf? Yep. Well, it's funny you say that because uh, part of our team's work is doing just that. Okay. So we collected a couple sediment cores from underneath the ice shelf. Uh, I don't particularly work on those, but uh, to my brief knowledge about them, they're quite uh, poorly sorted, gravelly uh, sediments, kind of like the one I showed on the top of that mm -hmm. um, high. Um, I think James Smith, if you know him, is working on those. But okay, yeah, we're, we're working on it, trying to get a whole sediment record even underneath the ice. Yeah, I mean, comparing with the, the cores that, that have been taken from underneath Pine Island Glacier would be a huge, um, huge advantage, like from having the, the shorter ice cores out there as well. You have some pretty good resolution that shows, you know, shifts in, in currents in the mid 20th century from, from James Smith and everybody's work. Um, and we see that suggestion as well from ice cores further inland towards, towards waste divide, but we don't have it from the perspective of the snow uh, right there on those glaciers and, and we can get it, it's there. So we just, we just need to keep working on that. One of the really um, fortuitous um, calvings of Pine Island this year, when we were on the Palmer in Pine Island, um, we were able to get to essentially the location that James Smith had cored from the ice in the past. And what that means is that as the ice retreats, um, those core sites that had been collected below the ice shelf, um, or below floating ice anyway, um, are now part of the marine record. And so that's really allowing us to make direct comparisons between what do we see at the very same location as it's changing. Dynamic environment. Good to know you're working it from both sides. Yeah. 
Um, so looking back in the chat, it looks like there was some conversation between Jim and some other folks um, about what Jim was talking about. Would you guys like to bring that for the whole group to discuss? Yeah, I can I can um, voice something there. Um, and Jim's, uh, Jim's still here. Uh, that was really interesting, uh, Jim. Thank you. Um, I think particularly just sort of interesting to how to see how tightly we can resolve that enhanced denudation um, episode. Um, I guess I was sort of yeah wondering the question I asked in the chat was you know, about the attributing that to a kind of enhanced or, or you know an, an expanded expansion of the ice sheet at that time. Um, I guess I was wondering this seems to line up quite nicely with other evidence for. Possibly, sort of some, I guess, like some of the earliest marine ice sheets around that that time. Is is that is that a sort of fair statement? And I guess so. Sort of, that's one half of the question, and the other half was you had. I think on one of the figures you had a, like a flow line, which sort of roughly trying to estimate where the sediment might have been coming from on shore. I think you sort of acknowledging in the figure that's sort of quite uncertain. I sort of wondered if there was any chance for kind of some more refined provenance study with these core records to try and better understand where the material might have been coming from? Cool. Yeah, so I guess uh, the second part of that, uh, talking about, um, uh, yeah, I think that was obviously a very approximate flow line, um, but I think you can, to some extent, um, increase uh, increase the sort of accuracy of that. Um, obviously, it's sort of somewhat limited by a lack of knowledge of what's under the ice uh, to sort of, uh, you know, trace it back to. But I think um, I would say something around the, the region of the modern um, Inchabler ice stream to, um, at some point, it seems like it matches quite well with um, the provenance of seeing it at E1521. So it's yeah, I think it's quite remarkable, really, that you're managing to get sediment uh, that that far across the the Sea. Um, yeah. Um, so I've forgotten the, the first part. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it was it was a long question. So that, that's that was great. So that the first part was, I guess, the part I sort of post in the chat as well. Kind of, it just is this. Does this seem to be kind of a, a coherent signal that's starting to come out of this sort of? development of some marine ice sheets at around 17, 18 MA. Does that seem quite, I think you yeah. pointed out the Levy et al paper as well. I think there are some far field evidence that suggests this might have been something happening at this time. Yeah, I think there does seem to be quite a lot of evidence basically there. Um, so Richard actually has a really nice figure that actually covers the exact period, which is uh, quite cool. Um, talking about the annual record where it seems to be grounded and this bay where there seems to be a lot of ID at this time. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm currently looking into sort of more far field records and trying to match those up as well. As you say, it does look uh, like stuff matches up. It's, it's good. Great. All right, so uh, kind of coming to the end of our session here, but I just thought it would kind of be fun since this is the session on past records, just to ask whole group, anyone can answer. Um, oh, we have a question for Rachel from Aurora, actually. Please take it away, Aurora. Hey, Rachel, it wasn't so much a question as just kind of a cool tangent um, to your work. I, I really like seeing the unsorted gravels in the ice core that would would have been close, or sorry, in the sediment core that would have been closest to the grounding line. Um, and it reminded me of some of the footage that the ice spin robot got this past season um, at the Thwaites grounding line, the current Th Thwaites grounding line, um, where they saw sort of this, these gravels and sediments actively falling out of the mm -hmm. vapor ice. Um, and I just thought that was a really neat mechanism of sort of the current modern mechanism happening that could extend back to that core that you had. Um, so it might just be a cool thing to show in future talks. Yeah, um, I've only, it's been a while since I've seen some of the images from that, but it is really cool to see what it's like right uh, closer to the grounding zone of this sediment coming out of the 
ice. Um, the core I showed, it's still figuring it out, but it seems like it might be bulldozing some of the older LGM deposits or till that was on that high. So it's slightly different mechanism, but um, yeah, it's all cool. Figuring out what the ice shelf is doing. Yeah, cool. That that makes sense. I, I think I often think of like connecting sort of like modern like processes happening now and then seeing where we can see that in the past. Yeah. Um, so cool. Yeah, thanks. Great talk. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we are winding up here. Um, so I know it's um, I'm probably standing between some of you and um, a cocktail. Um, or whatever your Friday wind down is. Um, so we'll bring it to an end, but just one more shout out for the two sessions that are next week, uh, which the links are in this chat for, and you should have also received an email. And just remember that you do have to fill out these forms and you have to re-register. It's not the same registration as what you did to join the science meeting. So um, with that, I just wanna thank all of our presenters today um, for their great talks. And um, thank you everyone for participating in the discussion. Have a lovely time. Yeah, thank you to all of uh, our speakers and uh, thank you to you all for attending. Yeah, thanks everybody for attending the, the Waste Workshop over the last two weeks. It's been great. And thanks to the, to the conveners as well, for sure. <laughs>